Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for our in-house guests, we would ask that courtesy to see that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as we begin. And of course, those watching online are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Leading our discussion is Nina ocherenko Schaefer. She is Senior Research Fellow in Health Policy in our Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity. She also serves as the Preston A. Wells Junior Fellow in Health Policy. Prior to joining Heritage, she served on Capitol Hill is with a career serving on the staffs of then Representative Jim DeMint, Representative Sue Myrick, as well as the late Senator Jesse Helms. She joined Heritage then in 2001, serving numerous capacities in our Department of Health Policy. Uh, most immediate to this current position, she was in the Trump administration as senior counselor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Please join me in welcoming Nina Ocherenko. Nina. Thank you and, and welcome again. Um, thank you for those joining in person and those joining um, on the internet watching for what I find a very important um, uh, discussion today. Every day there are stories that bring to light the plight of those who suffer from severe mental illness. An estimated 10 million Americans suffer, adults suffer from severe mental illness in our country. An estimated one in five people in homeless shelters and approximately 20% of those in jail or prison were classified as having a severe mental illness. Our expert set of panelists here today will provide their medical, legal, and policy insights surrounding addressing this very complicated issue. So let me introduce our panel. Um, we have Dr. Sally Sattel, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and practicing psychiatrist in Washington, DC. She was a professor of psychiatry at Yale University and remains a lecturer there today. She is a national expert on the topic of psychiatry and medicine and has written widely on the issue. She has testified before Congress and her work has been published in prominent academic journals and in major national publications. Following Dr. Sattel, we'll hear from J.D. Jaffe, Executive Director for Mental Health mentalillnesspolicy.org, and is an adjunct fellow at the Manhattan Institute in New York City. He has been an advocate for the severely mentally ill since the 1980s and has held positions at numerous nonprofit organizations. His articles have appeared in major national publications, and he is the author of Insane Consequences, How the Mental Health Industry Fails the Mental Ill, which was published in, 19, in, in 2017. We will then turn to get um, additional comments and some reactions from Andrew Sperling and John Malcolm. Andrew Sperling is with the National Alliance on Mental Illness. He is the Director of Legislative and Policy Advocacy, where he oversees NAMI's federal policy agenda. He is also a consumer representative on the National Association of Health Insurance Commissioners and is co-chair of the Consortium of Citizens with Disability and Housing Task Force. Finally, we'll hear from John Malcolm, who is Vice President in the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation and is Chairman of the Criminal Law Practice Group at the Federalist Society. Prior to Heritage, John Malcolm held several, several important positions, including General Counsel at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the Motion Picture Association, and the Department of Justice. He has taught and has written on the intersection of law and psychiatry. So please, well, please join me in welcoming our panel, and we'll have Dr. Sattel lead us off. Thanks, Nina and Heritage, for having this event. So as Nina said, I'm the psychiatrist here. And so I'm briefly, my role basically is to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about when we talk about severe mental illness. Um, so every few weeks, actually, I work at a, <clears throat> a clinic in the court, municipal courthouse, which is 500 Indiana Avenue. And it's really a, a great service. Um, it's basically it's for people who are awaiting trial. And at some point along their trajectory, either a judge that they saw is worried about their mental state or their probation officer is or, or someone else they come in contact with. So until their legal situation is resolved, they're sent to this court and a number, uh, excuse me, they're sent to this clinic. Uh, and uh, some of these folks have been on meds before and, you know, people do go on and off them. And, uh, and again, others are there 
to, for me to pretty much determine whether or not they need medications or, or even more, potentially hospitalization. So, okay, there I am. And I expected when I started this to see people with uh, you know, who were really ill. And, you know, a number of them are, there's no question about this, people who had diagnoses of schizophrenia, people who are, um, uh, you know, hallucinating, ha hearing voices, highly agitated, this kind of thing, folks who you think, well, if they need, they certainly need to have their medications restarted. But a lot of folks who are, uh, yeah, they're, they're anxious, and they may even have a diagnosable anxiety disorder, um, or they're depressed, but it tends to be, you know, depression with a small D, which sometimes is almost uh, hard to distinguish that a lot of times from basic demoralization, you know, which is rampant. A lot of folks have, you know, extremely chaotic and, uh, you know, unsettled lives, uh, problems at, at home. They're, they're just very worried about the outcome of, you know, what's going to happen with their case. Are they going to lose their job, um, you know, as I said, problems at home. So um, these are distressing things, no question about it, but that's not severe mental illness. And, um, you know, we talk to them. I mean, we have a, hopefully have a constructive interaction, but my point is that's not mental illness. That's mental health. And un unfortunately, un until now, and I'm sure we'll talk about the new leadership at SAMHSA and HHS, which I think is much more responsive to this distinction between mental health and mental illness. Um, there's been a lot of uh, confusion about it uh, in, uh, I'd say, it's at SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, with, with too much, a real imbalance in, in terms of the kinds of, of uh, um, let's say, constituents that they felt they should serve, which is to say way too much emphasis on the problems of people with, uh, with mental health problems and not enough on mental illness. Um, and one thing I see a lot of is people who are called bipolar. And that, I don't know where some of these psychiatrists find that diagnosis because um, now, granted, some people could be in a state that looks manic because they've just taken PCP or um, an, a stimulant. Usually that resolves within 24 hours or so. But, but you know, in cross-section, they look very agitated and possibly manic. Or they seem to say the magic two words, I have mood swings. Mm -hmm. And uh, bipolar illness, and I'm going to now talk about the severe mental illnesses, um, Bipolar illness is one of the most severe conditions uh, a person can have with a significant suicide rate. And um, it's, it's it is enormously uh, disabling. It is not merely mood swings. So just I'm just going to give you a little example from uh, a, a, this is a 23-year-old graduate student in engineering in Ohio, um, very briefly, when he was in a manic state, a bipolar, as the name implies, is uh, bi, you know, two, two states, two mood states, extreme excitement, agitation, elation, expansion, uh, sometimes with psychotic elements or a severe depression and mobilizing, uh, just a mobilizing de depression. So I had fantastical paranoid delusions. This is, this is, so this is a psych, a manic psychotic episode. Thinking I was the Antichrist, the Messiah, or both. I believe news channels were broadcasting live on TV and uh, for all the world to see me. Um, I got in fights with the Cleveland cops. I thought I was the president. Uh, this was grandiose ideas. This is a common uh, symptom of uh, manic, um, psych uh, manic uh, the manic phase. People can feel they're Jesus Christ or they're all powerful, um, even have auditory hallucinations telling them either they're very powerful or they're very, very worthless. Um, he, this particular person was seeing things, but luckily he responded to medication and uh, he says, my plans for the future, he's very, as most people with severe illnesses have to be, they to be very uh, uh, vigilant about stressful situations. So gradually he hopes to, uh, he's volunteering now and until, as he said, can handle the stress of a part-time job. His goal is to get back in civil engineering. So that's kind of in some ways a good outcome so far because he responds to medication. But... Um, it, 
just to illustrate what a severe condition that is. Um, so about 5% of the population is probably estimated to have, again, severe mental illnesses. And we think of schizophrenia when I say that. Uh, severe mental illness, bipolar is a classic severe mental illness. But to be fair, if you have a severe version of almost anything, obviously if you're anorectic to the point of being 89 pounds and having cardiac problems and thinking everything's fine, that's a severe mental illness. If you have such crippling PTSD, you, you, you can't leave the house, and uh, your, uh, your anxiety levels are almost unbearable to the point where you have to drink or use opioids to calm yourself down, that's a severe mental illness. So there's a severity component uh, that cuts across lots of obsessive compulsive disease, people who are just so... Um, uh, preoccupied with checking or washing or this kind of thing that it prevents them from getting a job and impairs them. They're either their stress is overwhelming and or they can't really function and participate in life. That's a severe mental illness. So that cuts across mental illnesses, but when we think uh, categorically of mental illnesses, they tend to be the, the bipolar or schizophrenic. So I'm going to speed up here. Um, just um, mention that, uh, as I said before, too long we've uh, prioritized severe mental illness. And now I'm making these distinctions because severely mental, severe mental, Ill, severely mentally ill people are the ones who are populating our jails. Unfortunately, because our system has clearly problems and this, the, the the network, the infrastructure of the mental health uh, system is is. Uh, bad in many places. Uh, homelessness is, is a very big problem as well. Uh, so clearly this is the population that's most vulnerable, needs the most, uh, you know, needs a, a lot of resources more than it had been getting in the past. But it doesn't mean that people who have milder symptoms do not deserve help. Uh, I, I, I want to make that clear. No one deserves to suffer needlessly. Also, someone who has mild symptoms may be on their way to having severe symptoms, so you do want to catch them early. But uh, again, um, severe mental illness and mental health are different things. Treatment usually involves medications, um, but also a lot of what's called psychosocial support. Um, and uh, treatment for psychosis is typically medications. Treatment for depression, if it's really severe, can involve shock therapy, which has gotten a terrible reputation over the years. I think people still have images of the snake pit or uh, what's that, uh, the Jack Nicholson show? Yeah, yeah. but um, it, ha it is perfected. Uh, let me tell you, if I had a severe mental illness um, and you know, you, if a person's suicidal, you can't even wait for medications to take mm -hmm. effect. Um, so I would get have shock therapy. It is, um, it's, it's highly effective. You know, there's very, there's acute confusion, obviously. You don't remember things in the near term, like the next day after you've had the shock therapy. It does not erase people's memory, and it's, uh, it's almost transforming. And that's, that's one of the aspects of severe mental illness as well, is when the medications work, uh, they don't work for everyone. People need combinations. They kind of work well or maybe not so well, but when they work well, it's a dr almost a dramatic transformation. I've seen that a lot in patients. So... Um, finally, I just wanted to mention, you can imagine when people are in these severe states, if they're not responding to medication fast enough, if they're refusing to take medication, um, if they're uh, imminently suicidal, if they're what's called gravely disabled, let's say someone's in the park in the winter, they're, they think that uh, all the food is poisoned, so they're malnourished, they're afraid to go to a hospital because the police are agents of, you know, some evil empire, and we have to talk commitment at this point, civil, you know, civil commitment. And I think that's a humane and benign thing, to, uh, definitely a humane thing to do when insight is severely impaired. That's a big problem with schizophrenia. A lot of individuals don't quite even realize they are sick. Um, but that's a very important thing to do. So I wanted to set out the, uh, it's kind of the landscape of what we're talking about when we talk about severe mental illness. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, DJ, whose book is fabulous, and, uh, and he'll talk about the policy. I didn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. 
Is this on? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, the forum asks, are policies helping or hurting people with severe mental illness? They are hurting people with severe mental illness, and the reason they're hurting people with severe mental illness has to do with the mental health industry made them that way. As Sally said, it's about 4%, 5%, 10 million who have a serious mental illness, mainly schizophrenia and bipolar, but not exclusively, as she explained. And 50% of these have what she was talking about. They're so sick, they don't even know they're sick. John Hinckley shot President Reagan because he knew for a fact that that was the best way to get a date with Jody Foster. That is serious mental illness, and we are failing people with it. In spite of the federal government spending $147 billion annually and states kicking in around another $50 billion annually, 400,000 seriously mentally ill are incarcerated. 140,000 mentally ill are homeless. Why is this? In spite of the massive spending, why is this? The reason is <clears throat> we moved from a hospital-based system, which by definition served people with serious mental illness, to a community-based system that largely ignores those with serious mental illness. And if you take away one thing today, that is it. Our mental health system is no longer focused on the most seriously mentally ill. In fact, 35% of the most seriously ill received zero treatment, nothing at all. No therapy, no medications, no ECT, nothing in the past year. The solution to fix this is to cut mental health spending and increase mental illness spending, replace mission creep with mission control. The other takeaway is that the reason we don't focus on the seriously mentally ill is because mental health advocates have convinced government that to spend its funds on improving mental wellness in the higher functioning. In fact, many of the groups, if you notice this, they don't use the term mental illness anymore. They'll say mental health condition, which of course is what somebody without a mental illness has. They have a good mental health condition. The new assistant secretary, Dr. McCants Katz, is trying to turn all this around. And in fact, she wants programs to be evidence-based. And to be, be evidence-based, everyone throws around the word, it has to imp have independent evidence. It improves a meaningful metric in people with serious mental illness. And the meaningful metrics that government should be working to improve are rates of homelessness, arrest, incarceration, suicide, needless hospitalization. Those are the meaningful metrics. But the mental health industry is not focused on those. For instance, it'll declare suicide programs a success based on number of calls to a helpline not number of suicides. It'll declare outreach programs a success based on number of contacts made, not whether anyone got treatment. Public education campaigns will be declared a success based on the number of people who saw it. There are many ways that the industry is diverting this $147 billion in federal funds away from the seriously ill. For instance, it teaches politicians, and it makes sound so common sense, if we intervene early, we can prevent mental illness. Well, the reality is we don't know what causes schizophrenia and bipolar. There will be a Nobel Prize to whoever figures it out. Now, we can prevent progression, as Sally said, but that means serving people with mental illness, not those without. The industry insists that we focus suicide prevention efforts on kids. 90% of suicides are in, in adults. As a result of their efforts, suicide funds are going where suicide isn't, to kids. And after every headline-grabbing act of violence, like a Parkland or a Virginia Tech, the industry tries to convince government to not take steps to reduce violence by the mentally ill. They pull out their favorite claim, the mentally ill are no more violent than others. The studies that show the mentally ill are no more violent than others are either of the 100% who can have their wellness improved, the 18% who have something, or even the 4% who are seriously ill, but they're not of the 4% who are untreated. The studies show treatment works 
no more, no less. And the industry knows the mentally ill are no more violent, are more violent than others. Psychiatric units are locked. Cancer units aren't. Psychiatric nurses wear panic buttons. Those in heart units don't. Outreach teams are go out in pairs for their own safety. The mental health industry is soliciting contracts to train police how to de-escalate in situations involving the mentally ill, not people with psoriasis. <laughs> so, so of course the untreated seriously mentally ill are more violent than others, and the industry has led us to ignore that. The industry teaches politicians that stigma is the big thing. And this month is some kind of mental health awareness month. There used to be a mental illness awareness month, but now we have a mental health awareness month. So that stigma is the biggest barrier to care. I have a mentally ill relative. Any mom of the seriously mentally ill knows that the reason they can't get care is there's no programs that will serve them. There aren't enough doctors. There aren't enough housing. There aren't enough services. Any mom of somebody with serious mental illness knows that the cost is too much, or if you're in a rural area, you can't get transportation. Stigma is far behind all those. The homeless psychotic guy eating out of a dumpster is not avoiding care because he thinks his fellow dumpster divers will think less of him. He's avoiding care because there's no one willing to care for him. The industry has moved away from that. And the industry now wraps anything that makes you sad in a mental health narrative and says we should divert funds to it. Poverty, bad grades, divorce, unemployment, angst about sex, gender identity, even sadness itself are now considered either mental health conditions or risk factors that government should spend on. And because anything that makes you sad is now an illness, anything that makes you happier is a treatment. So every dog is now a therapy dog. Or a therapy dog. No mental illness required. Now, how do we get out of this? Government has to start listening to police. Police have become, and criminal justice, they are the real experts on this. 30% of all calls to 911 involve emotionally disturbed persons. New York City, there were 165,000 EDP calls, so they've gained the expertise. And what do police say we need? The police say, well, when I take someone to a hospital, I need them to get in. So that means changing our civil commitment laws. Right now, our civil commitment laws basically require someone to become danger to self or others rather than prevent someone from becoming danger to self or others. That's ludicrous. I mean, seatbelt laws prevent danger. Why can't we have that with mental illness laws? Mental health advocates say that closing psychiatric beds reduces institutionalization. Police say it's nonsense. What closing psychiatric hospital beds did is it moved, hospital, it moved people from hospitals to jails. There are 10 times as many incarcerated as hospitalized now. So closing hospitals doesn't reduce it. And in order to fix that problem, we have to ameliorate the IMD exclusion. And that's a provision of Medicaid that says we will give states Medicaid money as long as they promise us they won't use it for those who are most seriously ill and need hospital care. Again, it's pretty ludicrous to prevent Medicaid funds from going to those who are the most seriously ill. Police want the people to be stabilized once they're released. They don't want, they, they call them round trippers, frequent flyers. They go in the hospital, they're out two days later, they don't take their medicines and they deteriorate. That can be accomplished through the use of assisted outpatient treatment. And after housing and the IMD exclusion, it's probably the most important change that's needed. Assisted outpatient treatment is for a very tiny group of the most seriously ill, a subset of them who won't take medicines and as a result already became homeless, arrested, incarcerated multiple times. And it allows judges to order them to stay in one year of mandated and monitored treatment while they're in the community. From a practical standpoint, they're probably gonna to be told to take medicines and to have a case manager 
who monitors that at minimum. They may be given other services. They should be given other services. But it has reduced homelessness, arrest, incarceration in the 70% range. By reducing the use of jails and hospitals, it cuts costs 50%. It should be a conservative dream program. And it's, it's less restrictive. It allows you to exercise more of your civil rights than inpatient commitment or incarceration. So these are some of the ways we can make a mental health system that does not serve the severely ill, serve the severely ill, and I assume after this we'll talk about what's coming down the pike in this area. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll kick off with some reactions and then we'll... So, uh, thanks for having me here. This is my, my name is Andrew Sperling. I'm with the National Alliance of Mental Illness. I want to go upstream a minute. Uh, not upstream in the course of the illness, but some, some observations about serious mental illness uh, that quite frankly drive the problems that Dr. Sattel and DJ were talking about. So let me start with the fact that our diagnostics are far below anything else in medicine. Uh, can you imagine, it, so the, our, our diagnostics are driven by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagno Diagnostic Statistical Manual. They're in there, what, they're six now? We're up to six? Five. Five. Uh, five. So th this is a, a, a really a massive Chinese menu of symptoms, of symptom symptomatology, but diagnostics are done in psychiatry by the subjective rendering of symptoms from the patient to the clinician. So imagine if we diagnosed heart disease by asking a patient on a scale of one to 10, how severe is your chest pain? Oh, it's only a four, you're fine. If we're an eight, I would be really worried that you're gonna have a heart attack. We, we don't do that in other forms of medicine. Now, we have a long way to go and the National Institute of Mental Health is working on something called RDOC, the Research Domain Criteria. It's a massive study trying to get us to better diagnostics. We're a, real, we're a long way away, but we gotta get better diagnostics. We, I meet NAMI family members that talk, in the, talk about their, their loved one who's went through four or five di diagnoses before they got the, the diagnosis right. And if you've got poor diagnostics, you're going to end up behind the eight ball on, on treatment. Uh, on treatment, we do not have it. All the medications are getting better. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how they're getting better in a second. But the fact of the matter is, all of them are palliative in nature. We do not have a disease-modifying therapy for schizophrenia. And I draw the, the, the analog to our friends. That, that, that there's been you know, complaints about the cost of the hepatitis C medications that are out there, right? Well, imagine if we had this in schizophrenia, that when you got a diagnosis of schizophrenia, we're going to put you on a six-week regimen of treatment. And at the end of that, there's a 90% chance that you will never have an episode of acute psychosis for the rest of your adult life. What would be the value of that? Now, again, Sally will tell me that's sort of in the science fiction realm right now. We're a long way away from that, but the fact of the matter is that's what we ought to be striving for, okay? So, uh, and there are indeed challenges in, in terms of getting these new therapies. We've had a number of companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, that in the last decade have exited this space, have decided that they're not going to make the investments in central nervous system diseases, including uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Why? Uh, because we don't have a biomarker for schizophrenia. We don't have that target that they had with HIV AIDS, that viral target to go after and really spur rapid innovation in, in new therapies, uh, we don't have animal models. You can't ask a lab rat if they're feeling depressed. So we've got a long way to go in, in incentivizing companies to get back into this, and we're working with a number of companies to do it. Some have left. Uh, I won't name names. Uh, but but the, the clinical trials take longer. There's a larger placebo effect than there is in other diseases, so you have to recruit a lot more subjects. The clinical trials cost a lot more and take a lot longer and are much more expensive for companies to invest in. Again, they're accountable, they're shareholders, I get that, but we are desperate at NAMI for newer, better therapies. Uh, the existing therapies we have have real challenges associated with them in terms of many of the, the antipsychotic medications have significant weight gain associated with them. Uh, imagine what it's like to tell a 25, 24 year old who's just been diagnosed with schizophrenia, we're gonna put you on this medication. You're probably gonna have to stay on this medication the rest of your adult life and you should expect particularly in the initial phase, to, to pack on 30, 40, or 50 pounds. What that feels like for a young person and the, to, to, to get them to engage in treatment. So we got, the, what the good news is that we do have newer antipsychotics that don't have weight gain associated with them. And on the adherence front, AOT works and we believe in it. We also have long-acting therapies, uh, some of which are, are, are now in, in development that can last as long as 90 days. They're, they're injections. Uh, some, some are 30 days. They're, we're getting to 60, even 90 days. Uh, imagine how we can improve adherence when all you have to do is just give that, give that individual schizophrenia the injection and know that they're going to have a level dose 
of an antipsychotic medication is going to last as long as 90 days. So we need to invest in those that are way underutilized, given their promise. Uh, and we have to do that. And finally, well, I'm, I'm going to talk on the plus side in a second, but, but we need to do some things with the FDA. And we're trying to get the, the attention of, of uh, Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, who is doing a fantastic job at the FDA. He's really trying to change things out there. But the psychiatric drug division at the FDA, for better or for worse, is still clinging to a lot of antiquated tools and a lot of antiquated ideas about what it means for a, a new medication to treat schizophrenia or major depression or bipolar disorder to be effective. Uh, they're using depression scales that are 70 years old. Uh, they're one of the most risk-averse uh, divisions at the FDA. They have the, the worst track record in terms of the, of, the, of the clinical review time. And we're hoping that Dr. Gottlieb is able to uh, spur some changes in that division so that, so that you know, when, when a company comes forward with an innovative therapy, the patients are able to access it. Now, finally, let me talk about the plus side for a second. I want to make a couple observations on that. We've been lucky the last few years to, have some, to make some terrific uh, improvements in, 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 in Congress. Uh, and make some, some changes in legislation. We had the work of Congressman, former Congressman Tim Murphy from Pennsylvania, uh, who chaired the Oversight Subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and held a whole series of hearings highlighting the real problems with the public mental health system in this country. And it resulted in a bill called the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. It was actually signed into law by President Obama in December of 2012. There were a lot of things in there. I won't, won't go through all the details, but it was really the first time we had a really discreet piece of legislation that focused not on mental health, but on serious mental illness. And there were a lot of provisions in there. There was a, a pilot program for assisted outpatient treatment that's now getting funding uh, and appropriation. Uh, we also had something called the, 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 the Interagency Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee. Uh, and kudos to Dr. Eleanor McCann's Katz, who was appointed uh, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health, which is a new title in addition to being the administrator of, of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. She used that, that in, uh, interagency coordinating committee to really make a whole series of recommendations that we think are going to uh, provide enormous dividends over time. We're very, very excited about that. And then we still continue to have strong support in Congress. Um, I'd, I'd call out certainly uh, Senator uh, Chris Murphy from Connecticut and Senator Bill Cassidy from Louisiana have a bipartisan partnership and continue to work on a whole range of issues uh, to try and improve things. So there, we've got a long way to go and big challenges to try and get better treatments uh, and, and get adherence. Uh, but I'm optimistic that we continue to have support in Congress and we're going to continue to get the attention from policymakers that we need. Well, I wasn't going to comment on anything Andrew said, but I'll, I'll start with a couple of things that struck me as he was saying this, I, I agree with him, of course, and I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, that it's in all fields of medicines that one should constantly strive to get uh, new and improved medications. I know in psychiatry there have been great steps made along those lines. Although I, I, I do think that psychiatrists face some particular difficulties in that we're talking about diseases of the brain, which are harder to, to see and to determine and to figure out exactly what disorder we're talking about. It's usually based on how people act that you're able to make these, these sorts of, of diagnoses. I mean, if somebody has cancer or a heart disease, you know, they're not really going to question that, and you can sort of see that, and there's a treatment for it, and most people will not deny that they have cancer or heart disease, so they will take the medications, uh, and, but that's not the case with antidepressants uh, and, and antipsychotic medication. Harder to determine uh, exactly what it is going on. A lot of the people who suffer from these dis disorders are in denial that they uh, are having these disorders. And the side effects, and all medications have side effects. Anyone who's seen a drug commercial on TV knows that you know at the very end, they're rattling through the 49 terrible things that can happen to you while they're smiling and tell you you should take the drugs anyway. But for the, for the antipsychotic medications, those side effects are real, and they're obvious, and they happen fairly quickly. You mentioned weight gain, but there's involuntary movements, tardive dyskinesia, and it's, so it's, it's a harder field in which to, to deal. Now let me step back and, and offer on, the, on other comments that I had. So I started thinking about mental illness. Uh, I mean, I used to, to teach it a while ago, uh, psychiatry and law. But after the, the Newtown shooting uh, about you know, violence by, uh, by the mentally ill. And of course, we, we now have this with Nicholas Cruz in the Parkland uh, shooting. And, and DJ touched upon this, is that there's a whole field of people out there, advocates for the mentally ill, who will say that, you know, the mentally ill are no more violent uh, than any of the rest of us. I think he's correct that usually they're, they're talking about sort of mental health issues. So I think it's certainly true that people with mild depression uh, or suffering from anxiety disorders are not any more violent than anybody else 
uh, who is here. Uh, but I think that there are some obvious facts. So for instance, if we're talking about uh, gun violence, just one simple fact, two thirds of all gun related deaths are, are, are people who commit suicide. Uh, and practically by definition, not everybody who commits suicide is suffering from a severe depression or worse, uh, but there's clearly something going on that led them to take this rather dramatic act. Uh, and in terms of, of the rest, uh, it's been estimated that about 10% of, uh, of gun-related violence and 60% or more of mass shooters are suffering from a severe mental illness. Now, even then, as DJ, I think, correctly points out, it's difficult to tell because Sally and DJ po both pointed out it's only a small percentage of the population that suffers from a severe mental illness. And it is also true that people who suffer from severe mental illnesses who are being treated are not real, you know, they are probably not much more of a risk uh, of violence uh, than, uh, than the rest of us. But it's that small percentage of people who are suffering from severe mental illness, maybe not such a small percentage, who are going untreated, who are uh, an extreme risk of violence. And by the way, they're not only far more likely to be perpetrators of violence, they're also, sad to say, far more likely to be victims uh, of violence because they're out in the streets and they're homeless and bad things are being done to them. Uh, and you know they, they can't report it and can't react to it uh, in, uh, in an appropriate way. Way. So, you know, how did we, oh, and, and one other thing that Sally mentioned that I think is, of course, correct, and, and DJ mentioned it too, which is people who are suffering from severe mental illness, particularly if they're uh, homeless, they will take drugs or drink to self-medicate, and there are all kinds of studies that show that if you have an untreated severe mental illness and you are self-medicating, that what was already a higher risk goes much higher that you are going to be uh, a perpetrator of violence. So, you know, I, I think it's worth sort of stepping back and, and, and saying, how did we get here? Uh, Sally talked about this a little bit with respect to electroconvulsive therapy, and, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and the, the shock of watching Jack Nicholson, you know, getting this treatment and sort of developed a, a bad rap. I know people who have had uh, ECT, and, and it's helped them uh, dramatically. But so, you know, we used to have in this country uh, people who had a need for treatment mm -hmm. model. Sally referred to a civil commitment as being humane and benign. And I think that is, that is largely correct. And it used to be seen that way up until the 1950s and early 1960s. People would be civilly committed based on a need for treatment and state facilities. There were a lot of state-run mental institutions. And two things happened only maybe three, at the same time in the late 50s uh, and early 60s. One of them is that some of these state-run facilities were truly a deplorable uh, uh, condition. So for instance, a little trivia, everybody knows Geraldo Rivera, perhaps you may not know the, how Geraldo Rivera got his initial start was he uh, wrote an expose on one of these uh, facilities in New York called Willowbrook. Uh, and then there were a whole series of exposés that some of these state-run institutions were really in terrible shape. At the same time, there started being these first generation of antipsychotic medications. So people started thinking, well, maybe you know, people can be in a less restrictive environment and they can get the kind of community treatment that, um, that DJ uh, referred to. And I think he's correct that we move from a hospital-based treatment to a community uh, a, a treatment model. The courts then uh, stepped in. You had a D.C. Circuit Court uh, case in 1966, Lake versus Cameron, that introduced the concept of keeping people in the least restrictive environment in which they can receive treatment. You had a couple of Supreme Court uh, cases in the 70s, a 75 case, O'Connor versus Donaldson, that established the commitment standard of, of uh, imminent danger to self or others for civil commitment. Four years later, uh, in 1979, in Addington, versus Texas, uh, the court said that this is such a deprivation of a liberty interest that um, establishing dangerous to self or others based on a preponderance of the evidence, which was the standard in most of the states at the time, was no longer going to cut it, that it had to be by clear and convincing evidence. And that is a very, very difficult 
standard to prove for somebody who is in fact not been violent. As DJ says, the civil commitment laws, laws now require people to be a danger to self and others rather than you know, trying to treat them to prevent them from becoming a danger to self or others. And that began a massive deinstitutionalization uh, movement. Uh, and you know, I, I think that civil libertarians believed that people would that there would be treatment facilities available in the communities to to deal with this, or that people who were in distress would voluntarily uh, seek treatment. It turns out that neither of those is true. That people don't, for the most part, when they are ill, uh, admit themselves for voluntary uh, treatment either because of stigma or for other reasons, cost. Uh, and in terms of community treatment, since the in the last fifty years. Over 90% of, of psychiatric beds uh, in state facilities have been eliminated. You have, of course, uh, heard, uh, everybody has said, that the reality is that these people have been reinstitutionalized. They're just not in psychiatric facilities. They're now in jails and prisons. And that causes huge problems for our criminal justice system. It's unjust. Uh, to the people who are who are incarcerated. They're, of course, victims of the crimes that they commit uh, who otherwise wouldn't have been committed. And also, by the way, if you care about it, it poses huge problems for the police who have to confront the people who are severely mentally ill, who are oftentimes very dangerous and reacting. And after all, cops are cops and not uh, psychiatrists. So I guess what I would, would just say is that I, I certainly hope for improved uh, psychiatric uh, treatments in the form of medications, but I do think that it's time to revisit in communities how much uh, people are prepared to invest in those community resources. And I also think that there needs to be a revisiting of the standards for, uh, for civil commitment. So in addition to being a danger to the self or others, there's also grave disability people who can't really feed themselves. Perhaps courts need to take a more expanded uh, definition uh, of that. Perhaps it's time for the Supreme Court to revisit its jurisprudence in that area. And I also hope that there is more resort made to, uh, if you will, involuntary outpatient treatment, the, the pressure of a judge saying, look, you're perilously close to going to jail or being involuntarily committed. Perhaps you should go to outpatient ther uh, therapy and take the treatment. And by the way, I'll be monitoring to see how you do. So that's, those are my remarks. Thank you all so much. I think that um, it really did kick off what the hope of this event is. Uh, before we open it up to questions, though, I think it would be great to see if the panelists have reaction or some things jumped out at them that they would like to uh, discuss even amongst themselves, if you have a... Um, Andrew mentioned, I think they both mentioned, I think maybe I mentioned, the Interagency Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee, ISMIC, uh, and that's important, but there's another committee that I think might be more important. Um, Trump issued an executive order and it formed a federal interagency council on crime prevention and improving reentry, FERC it's called. And the interesting thing about it, so it's an interagency criminal justice committee, but the executive order specifically says one of the things you should do is look at mental health laws and mental health policies. And I think that whatever recommendations they come up could be very helpful. And it's interesting because uh, they just appointed uh, an executive director, and it's David Mulhassen, who I understand used to be a heritage person. So I think on the horizon, in addition to the ISMIC, uh, this FERC committee will be of interest. Maybe we can, um, I can tee off a, a question, too, about what, um, building on what Andrew said, what do you see coming down the pike this year or in the next few years that you think will make a make some a difference besides these two commissions what what other things do you all see perhaps well I'm not, there's, yeah. there's an immediate one in a few hours yes okay <laughs> uh, the president's going to make a speech about drug pricing and, and why do i why do i draw attention to that well he's hopefully he's going to be able to draw a careful balance between um, you know, the, the, need, the need to lower spending, lower uh, drug pricing uh, against the needs for the development, the, the research and development that needs to happen in this arena. Now, we're a little bit different than many other fields of medicine in that most of the, all, all of the, two of the antipsychotics that are out there, and I think there's only three antidepressants that still have patent protection. So generic drugs are available, and the drug spend on our people is relatively low because uh, we haven't had the wave of innovation we've had in other areas, and a lot of our, we have generic uh, forms of medications available. We're, we'll be looking to see to make sure he, talks about establishing that balance, you know, and, and he will talk a lot about how the, the, the bulk of the research is done, it, it, it's paid for, it's financed by, by Americans. That, that, that because of the way drugs are priced abroad in Europe and Latin America and Asia, uh, w Americans are left 
uh, paying for the bill for the R&D, and, and, and there needs to be ways to address that. But we want to make sure uh, we strike the right balance and we don't disincentivize the investments we need in research and development because, again, the therapies we have are not nearly good enough uh, given the public health burden associated with, with uh, serious mental illness. Uh, what I see happening is that opioids are sucking the air out of the room. Uh, a bill just passed the uh, Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee, and what it does is it ameliorates this IMD exclusion, allows Medicaid funds to go to substance abuse. There aren't enough beds, uh, as was pointed out, and so what's going to happen now is the hospitals are going to kick the seriously mentally ill out who are unreimbursed in order to make room for opioids who are reimbursed. So I think it's going to get worse. Yeah. Just one final point about uh, sort of a paradox of advocacy in this in this field because uh, some of the folks who uh, and everyone's well-meaning to be sure but uh, some of the folks who sort of bill themselves and frankly have been funded <laughs> by SAMHSA and are often have an anti-medication agenda and they're um, uh, well DJ alluded to the these folks uh, who want to push the a, more money for mental health, but also kind of deny the reality of, of uh, severe mental illness. Um, but they're, uh, it, so it's ironic that they put themselves forward as advocates for this group when uh, clearly it's such a selected group. These are the people, even if they did have a severe mental illness at one point, and actually some people, I mean, some people do actually recover. Um, but in any case, they're putting themselves forward as, as representatives when they're a highly select group. Uh, and this was one problem at SAMHSA, which Dr. McCann's cats, I, I'm sure, is really working hard to change the culture, where they would get their input. I mean, you think, isn't this wonderful? We're going to get feedback from people who are severely mentally ill on what they need, how the system could improve. So they have focus groups. Well, you think people hallucinating in a back bedroom are showing up for this? No. So they get a highly distor distorted input. And I don't think they realize that. And Congress sometimes gets that as well. Uh, I ironically, for this group, some of the best uh, representatives are, are NAMI and Andrew, my hero, mm -hmm. and the Treatment Advocacy Center in, in Arlington, which focuses almost exclusively on uh, the, well, does focus on the severely mentally ill, uh, revising commitment laws, uh, which are different in every state. And some are uh, more progressive, and I mean that in a good way, than others, where they really have sort of a wide scope of even need for treatment in some states. I think Arizona is one of them. So you know, people who are imminently dangerous, gravely disabled, and who are known to fail with Without the treatment and need it desperately. Anyway, um, but uh, that's sort of a, in most health areas, you know, the advocates are people who have, truly have the condition. Um, obviously, they're well enough to get out there, but at one point they were probably suffering quite a bit until they got on medication, but we don't see that as, as reliably in this area. I guess the only thing I was going to say is just pick up on one thing Sally just said, which is don't underestimate that there are a lot of people out there who are really anti these medications. In the same way that you had one flew over the cuckoo's nest for electroshock treatment. I mean, there are people who are saying that, you know, the person who is babbling in the street is not mentally ill, it's just a reflection of that person's personality. And and that this is a good thing and that they should not be medicated. And it is also true that in addition to the side effects that I measured, that some of these medications will blunt somebody's affect. It will sort of, you know, ramp things down a little bit that's a good thing, unless you are a believer that what they are really doing is squelching that person's personality. And those folks are out there and they have influence. And, and the other groups that have influence in anti-treatment agenda is there's a group within the health HHS called uh, Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. These are lawyers. They originally had a great mandate to protect the rights of the mentally ill, but they have decided that the, the, the right they want to protect is the right to refuse treatment. So they're a big impediment. There's also a similar division within the Department of Justice called the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, and they're the ones bringing the Olmstead suits, and these are suits that says everybody can live in the least restrictive environment and suing and pressuring states to kick people out of hospitals, out of adult homes, and out of any type of congregate facility. Let's go open it up for questions. Um, let's start right here. 
Hi, uh, my name is Will Estes, and I'm a med student in Central Texas. Um, and, you know, in Texas, the biggest provider of inpatient mental health services is the Harris County Jail. In fact, they care for more patients every day uh, with mental illness than the entire inpatient census of all 10 of our state hospitals put together. Um, so, you know, obviously we need more inpatient capacity, and the question is how we get there. You know, we talked about repealing the IMD exclusion, and that's Medicaid, that's one option, but I wonder, you know, what other solutions are there, and is there a private option for us to grow our inpatient capacity? I, I think people need housing, and this is the, probably the single biggest need, and whether that's in an inpatient setting, and I don't think in most cases it has to be, but they need housing. And it's interesting to me that when I started advocating in the 80s, that was the number one thing all the mental health groups advocate for. Now they're largely off the table. Group homes are off the table. One is they're politically incorrect because you're suggesting people with mental illness live together and the NIMBY groups don't want them. So it's just uh, how, how, you know, so it can be a continuum of housing, but we're getting rid of hospitals. Now there are lawsuits kicking people out of adult homes, what used to be called nursing homes. Um, NIMBY, you can't start a housing, uh, you know, so they're just this, there's massive pressure not to house the mentally ill. So on IMD, we have made some progress. So we, we did get a rule at the end of the Obama administration that got codified in that bill I talked about, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. It allows for, for payment in an IMD as part of a capitated Medicaid managed care contract for up to 15 days in any calendar month. So that's helping. Um, uh, we need, IMD actually is the solution just because the, 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 the vast majority of people with severe and persistent mental illness in this country are served by, by, by Medicaid and not by private health insurance. Um, so we've made some progress. I'm a little worried about the provision on substance abuse that's in the House bill uh, that the full committee will be taking up next week simply because it limits the federal dollars that can go into IMDs for substance abuse to new beds. So in order for a state to do this, they would have to build new beds. With nothing, we want new beds. But the existing facilities that are deemed IMDs, none of that new federal money can go to them. And that's what, because what we want is for the, the existing beds out there that in, in, in existing facilities that are deemed by the government to be IMDs, if we get a repeal, we want those dollars to go into those because they're already in the community, but Medicaid can't finance the, the care in those beds. Uh, Paul Larkin from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, it seems not uncommon to see alcohol or drug abuse as comorbidities with uh, mental disease. Uh, as DJ said, it seems that right now all the oxygen is being sucked out of the room by attempts to deal with uh, the drug abuse problem, particularly opioids. What policies can be used to promote the interests of both the people who are suffering from a substance abuse problem or addiction and the people who also are, are suffering from mental illness at the same time. I've got one, but Sally, yeah, if you... Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. We have an antiquated federal rule that was developed during the Nixon administration in 1972 called 42 CFR Part 2. I could go on for an hour about what this is, but it's an antiquated rule that sets up a regime for consent of sharing of records. Um, and this was passed 18 years before HIPAA, and we had the rules on HIPAA on, 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 on sharing of, of, of patient records and data sharing, uh, and then the consent for that. Um, so what it means is that substance abuse treatment records are separated from the rest of the healthcare system, right? So there are big problems uh, that result from that for our ability to integrate care. What we know is for individuals with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and a comorbid uh, uh, substance abuse problem like an opioid addiction or... or, 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 or serious alcoholism, is you've got, to cook, you've got to integrate that care. You can't treat them siloed. And unfortunately, this rule keeps the data, the, the, the patient information siloed, right, the, the patient records. But the good news is Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen and Congressman Earl Blumenauer, uh, bipartisan Congressman Mullen's a Republican from Oklahoma, Congressman uh, Blumenauer is a Democrat from Oregon, have a bill that's going to be marked up by the House Energy and Commerce Committee, we hope, next week, H.R. 3545, the Overdose Prevention and Safety Act. Uh, we had a hearing on Tuesday. Uh, there was some carping, if you will, from some privacy advocates about how this would result in substance abuse treatment records being posted to the internet and given to employers and landlords. 
Uh, but we've got real bipartisan mo momentum behind this bill, uh, and we're hopeful it will advance. This will really help us integrate care. The, the addiction psychiatrists need, and, and also, quite frankly, the biggest public health burden with these individuals is many of them have two or three comorbid chronic medical conditions that are all, that are all poorly treated, diabetes, COPD, and they're in the emergency room three times a month. We, we, we've got to be able to integrate care, and we have to have uh, an accessible record for, for every clinician touching those pa these patients. There may be a strange irony here because, you know, we, uh, we say that uh, um, you, you probably hear all the time addiction is a chronic disease. And in some people, yes, they relapse a lot. So it, it appears chronic. I mean, that's what chronicity is over the years and years and years. But those individuals, when you look at a population of people who are, let's say, heroin addicted, are mainly people with these other conditions who are the comorbid population. So if things work, it, if we really do, ironically, build up a, a good mental uh, substance abuse treatment infrastructure, uh, this should be part of it, as a, as a, almost as a way to identify and, and, and capture, uh, it, it, again, in a benign sense. And when I said benign before, I left out benign paternalism. I mean, it's certainly not benign to the person. At the time, it can be very, you know, it, it, there's often tension, you know, uh, it has, right. it's not a comfortable thing to take someone into a hospital when they're resistant. So, but the ultimate effect it's, is, as I said, humane because it gives them more freedom in the end. Uh, and there have been studies that show people who have been committed uh, are actually grateful in the end on, on balance. But just want to clarify that. That's what I meant. But th that even though we are, you're right, the addiction and opioid is sucking the air out of the room. But as it sucks, it might be able to, to catch some people with severe mental illness and, and, and finally get them, you know, in a, in a system, hopefully. Do we have another question? Oh, yes, right here. And, yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, from a family perspective, one of the... Um, uh, biggest barriers has been the HIPAA laws in terms of finding out what families need to help their ill family member with a serious mental illness. And I know that the uh, federal government did issue a little guidance to clarify that, but what was issued really wasn't helpful at all in the situations where somebody doesn't realize they're ill, they say, no, I don't want you to talk to my family, they're from outer space or whatever. <laughs> And um, and is there still any discussion of further um, modifying the HIPAA laws to help families out? Yeah, and is there a way of maybe combining it with the 42 CFR? So, so Congressman Murphy from Pennsylvania, former Congressman Murphy, did take on HIPAA uh, full board and had several different versions of, of statutory changes to HIPAA that were in his legislation. In the end, they fell out because they were quite controversial. And we were taking on big privacy interests far beyond mental health about some of the issues around HIPAA. And, and the problem, and that was over on the House side. On the Senate side, I think the challenge was there, there are a lot of interests around HIPAA that, have, again, have nothing to do with mental health and the fear of opening up HIPAA, what we call a, what's called a markup session, where the committee where any amendment related to HIPAA can come in. You've got health plans. You've got the, the, the physician groups. You've got employers, you know, all with their, their agenda on HIPAA, and no one wanted to take on this massive fight between huge interests. And so that's the challenge of making a statutory change to HIPAA. The good thing about the guidance, though, is we're, we're, the guidance is starting to move us away from saying, here's what you can't do to here's what you can do. And the guidance is very specific with a whole lot of things about, no, no, in these situations, when there's acute psychosis and it's an emergency situation, you can talk to the family. And what, NAMI is going to be working on a brochure that actually we, we, the families can say, when, when, when the physician says, I'm not going to talk to you about what's going on, I'm not even going to acknowledge that, that your son's in, in the inpatient unit on the, on the side of that door, and, and, and arm them with the ability to say, no, no, the guidance says, you have to talk to me. And so we're, we're, we're hopeful that we can make some progress on this with, with the guidance, uh, because over the short term, I'm not terribly optimistic that Congress is going to open up HIPAA to amendment. And it's great to have then the advocacy yeah. groups out there because it helps to translate what's yeah. out as regulation or guidance into real life tools for, for the American people. Uh, John, you had something? Uh, just to be very quick, and then I know DJ wants to say anything. Just another ramification of that is um, <laughs> so uh, under federal law, somebody who's been adjudicated to be mentally ill uh, is uh, not allowed to purchase a firearm. And a lot of advocacy, I mean, a lot of states have not entered that data into the National Incident Background Check System, citing HIPAA and privacy laws. And so that is a 
that gray area has, in some cases, actually led to loss of life. It's a huge issue. Uh, families that can't, and I was in this situation. Uh, my sister-in-law hospitalized. I wasn't allowed to know the diagnosis, what rehab program she was supposed to participate in, or what medicines, or even that she was on medicines. So I couldn't arrange transportation. I couldn't get prescriptions refilled. Uh, someone, I wasn't in this next situation, but it's not uncommon for people to start deteriorating because they're not on medication. So rather than getting them going to the pharmacy and getting the medications, the families have to go to court and get orders of protection. So HIPAA needs fixing. I don't think the fixes that were done were anything. Uh, Andrew's entirely right. The, we, they started with big ones. Um, but families who provide housing and case management and pharmacy services out of love should be entitled to the same information that those who provide those services for money get. And if you work in a program, the reality is the uh, lawyer for that program, uh, the risk management officer, is going to say there's less risk if you don't disclose. So the regs can be whatever you want, but they're not going to disclose. I think we'll take another question. Thank you, Terry Miller with Heritage Foundation. Uh, the civil commitment issue has come up on a number of comments that you made over the course of the presentation. And John, I think you went so far as to say that it might be necessary for the Supreme Court to revisit this at some point. And I guess my question would be, is there a process by which that can, can happen? Are there prospects for that issue to be revisited? And uh, is there anything that could be done to move that along? Well, I, I don't know. The answer is yes. Uh, so what you can do is you can get uh, a state to revise its laws and to walk into lower federal court and say, please rule against us. Under binding Supreme Court precedent, we deserve to lose. But to get that case up to the Supreme Court and get amicus support uh, from the psychiatric community uh, saying that, you know, maybe back in the 60s uh, that was appropriate, but, you know, that is no longer the case and that people are really being deprived more of their liberty interests uh, by being left out into the streets to rot with their rights on than they are in these humane facilities. It's a, it, it's a single probably most productive thing that be, can be done. All decisions now involving, if you, if you have a mentally ill relative, you have to call a lawyer before you call a doctor to get treatment. and. My nonprofit mental illness policy org has tried working with attorneys and looking for what that case would be and welcome any help from anywhere on doing that. I think um, we, oh, one more question and then uh, we'll have to close it out. Oh, oh sorry. There's so many different fascinating lines, uh, but I, I wanted to come around on the medicine and the research agenda because Andrew pointed out a couple of things on that. One is uh, the lack of um, evidence of the biological or the physical cause of uh, many of these illnesses. Uh, so my two questions are, one, uh, in terms of FDA review, uh, have you all been working like the cancer groups did with FDA on things that are like surrogate endpoints for trials and things like that. The other thing that was not mentioned here I'd be interested in is to what extent you all think that the priorities at NIH, which is doing sort of the basic research, are the right priorities. Uh, because I could envision that, and there's the National Institutes for Mental Health, obviously there's a lot of money and Congress funds NIH uh, well. The, it would seem to me that the logical place for government funding of research in this area would be on identifying you know, biological uh, sources, and then once you did that, the private sector could go on with drug development. Yes, so, so on the FDA side, uh, we have, it'll likely be probably in August, uh, although it may slip to September, um, I'm sorry, November, a, a, a major patient-focused drug development meeting. Um, th these were authorized under something called PDUFA, the Prescription Drug U User Fee Act, the, the PDUFA 5 from a few years ago and now PDUFA 6. Uh, we're going to scale with this. We did not have uh, one of the, the meetings with FDA, so that's moving forward on patient-focused drug, patient drug development to look at surrogate endpoints, uh, to look at various things. Uh, we also, the NIMH, the new, oh, not now he's been over, over a year, Dr. Joshua Gordon, uh, one of his priorities is uh, working to identify biomarkers and, and, and targets uh, particularly related to psychosis. 
uh, that, that that could actually spur drug development because it actually gives a validated target uh, that a company could go after. And we're going to have to work with the FDA on that to validate it as well so that the FDA believes you know, that this is a valid target to go after. So some exciting things, and we're hopeful uh, to get the attention of Dr. Gottlieb on many of these things, the FDA commissioner. Okay, so I'm cheating, and I'm going to allow one more question. <laughs> Uh, Grado is the student from the uh, study medical policy. Uh, one more uh, like suggestion is that um, the, like the uh, medical intervention is costly, especially for R and D. And um, but have you ever think about to like maybe just a, a paper of like instruction to tell the like especially homeless or the ex coms or the criminal like the, to how to strengthen their spiritual spiritual like strengthen their spiritual uh, um, the house with those instructions, like a uh, basic education for them, mm -hmm. so they can self self sustain, so they can be self su sufficient. Like so, maybe so is is the question sort of how do medicine? we or no? How do we get advocacy? How do organizations provide advocacy and information and education to the homeless people? Yes, and like combined with uh, medication, like the, those two combined like, from like physical and like two wow. sides. Maybe. Any good, you know, any good treatment would setting any good treatment provider, uh, and, and I realize that's not always a given. But uh, recognizes that medication is, you know, the it just it, it, medication is is frequently essential for stabilization, and people often have to stay on it. That's a that's highly individual how long a person stays on it. Sometimes a lifetime. Other times there can be some some tapering, uh, depending on other contexts. But the point is that uh, then there's a whole rehabilitation you know aspect to it and a whole socialization dimension. Now, if it's a young, if it's a young kid, it's you know people that's a big psychological adjustment. Even if you know that the acute systems uh, symptoms are over, that's that's a massive. Uh, um, it's it's a major life um, event to, to know that you have that kind of vulnerability and you need the meds uh, at least for a while. So that involves a lot of uh, and a lot of work on uh, just feeling comfortable with yourself in the world, how you're going to you know progress in your life. Other people who have been uh, isolated for so long need uh, you know or call what is this. If, What's that place called? In the foundation, Fountain House. Fountain House. yeah, Fountain House. these kind of uh, excellent uh, uh, places that you know try re you know try to rehabilitate people in a, in a vocational sense or at least just a social one because without socialization, you know, there's almost no life for many people. Well, I think we'll end on that note. I have a couple of uh, comments. One, um, I just want to thank everyone, uh, the panel, of course, thank the people that attended and those that are watching online. Well, um, I am not an expert in this field, but one of the reasons why I wanted to host this event is because I really wanted to broaden people's awareness of severe mental illness and really broaden the understanding of what the policy obstacles are just to kind of get that conversation going and make this more of a mainstream issue rather than a niche issue that people are, that only people that self-select here are interested in. Um, and then I also want to mention again that uh, DJ Jaffe has his book, a few of them um, ready for for purchase, if folks would like to, it's a great read. It's actually a very easy read, which makes it even a better book. I don't know uh, you don't have words. to study it. <laughs> yeah, there's no studying involved. You can just read it um, leisurely as you want. Um, and I guess with that, thank you again for the panel, and this will conclude our event. <laughs>